We ask that you would just bless this time together. Lord, we pray for our mothers. That you would bless them and keep them. Give them the wisdom to lead their families, their children. Lord, thank you for all of our spiritual mothers. The women that come up alongside of other young women and that, encourage them. Teach them in the ways of the Lord. Lord, we're uh, so blessed. We're blessed to come into your presence this morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a new day, a day that you just created for us to worship you in, a day to do your work, a day to spend with you. So take captive every thought that's going through our mind, bring them into captivity unto you, as it says in your word. And Lord, teach us from your word this morning. Encourage us. And bless this time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Your grace is enough. 
this place I love you been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been Sweet. 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you
Lord, we will sing the goodness of you. Lord, you bring us bring us through trials and temptations. You bring us through difficulties. You bring us through the good times as well as the bad. And we thank you for being with us, Father. One of your names is Emmanuel, God with us. And no matter what we're facing in our lives, you promise to never leave us, don't forsake us. Lord, we want to lift up the Donaldson family before you this morning. They've lost their son. And we ask you to be with them, to encourage them. Be with us, friends and families and co-workers, Father, to just encourage them and draw them close unto you. We don't understand how these tragedies of life happen or why. But we do know this, that you work all things together for good for them that love you. And even in the midst of this, Father, you will bring good about. You'll bring some into a personal relationship with you. You'll encourage others and heal. And we ask that you would just come upon them in the presence of your spirit, Father, and heal their wounded hearts right now. That you'd mend their broken spirits and give them peace. Lord, we ask you to be with each of us, with those that are going through the trials and situations in their lives, those that are dealing with illnesses, those that are dealing with weakness in their bodies. Father, I pray that you would come upon them in the power of your strength, of your Holy Spirit, and heal them. Those that are dealing with just overwhelming situations in their lives, that you would come next to them and let them know that they're not alone. That you're with them every step of the way. Now, Father, we ask that you would just come upon us in strength and the power of your Holy Spirit. That you'd open up our eyes and we might see the wonderful truths of your word. And that we would apply them to our life and bring glory to your name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you again. Happy Mother's Day to each of you ladies out there. Whether you are a biological mother or a spiritual mother, God blesses you and you minister to each of us. And I know many of you out there, including my mother, but I have spiritual mothers and spiritual sisters in this family of God that are always there encouraging us and praying for us. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for praying for the people in this church. Thank you for being an example to the children and praying for them. As you know, families can't do it by themselves. They need each of us to come alongside of them and be praying for them. And that's what Mother's Day and Father's Day is all about, is family. And we are one big family here at Christian Worship Center, aren't we? It is incredible. And I just say thank you for being part of our family. And again, welcome home because this is a great place to be. James. Yes. <laughs> we can always welcome more to the family, can't we? That's because our love is, is ever growing. You can't out love. And it's so true. Well, this morning I'm going to take a break from Luke chapter 9. Don't get too excited out there. But 
the, the section that we were going to would, would have been studying today would be dealing with casting out demons. And I didn't think that was necessarily appropriate for Mother's Day. <laughs> and in prayer, now well, maybe sometimes, because <laughs> we all deal with stuff, don't we? But I wanted to give a message of hope, and God put on my heart to talk about a woman named Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And she gives us an example of a woman who's dedicated to God, a woman who is um, going through trials in her life, times when they were overwhelmed, times when they wanted to throw the towel in and give up. So I'm going to ask that you'd open up your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's in the Old Testament. First Samuel chapter one. And we're going to begin reading in verse number one as well. It says there was a certain man of Ramathim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, son of Eliu, son of Tohu, son of Zufa, an Ephrite. Now say those names real fast. That'll trip you up. But Elkanah had two wives, it says in verse 2. The name of one was Hannah, the other name was Paniah, and Paniah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Paniah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as they went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. And therefore, Hannah wept. And would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? We're going to pause in our testimony there this morning for just a few moments. And I want you to get the picture of what's happening. You have two ladies that are rivals in a marriage. At this time, it was custom to have more than one wife. So it's not something that was unfamiliar. But here, one had several children and one didn't have any. And the one that had several children was provoking the other one when they would go up to the temple. And actually, it wasn't a temple. Let me back that up. They were in Shiloh. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was at this time. And uh, they would go up three times a year, which was mandatory, to worship all the men. Now here we get the picture of Elkanah because he's taking his wives and his children going up to the temple. We need to realize that during this time, they were surrounded by enemies. They were always on the move. They, were, they weren't able to build a temple or a place of worship. They were always under attack. And yet this man kept him and his wives and his children focused on worshiping God. So we learned that they were devout. They were devout in their relationship with God. 
No matter what trials we may be facing, we need to be devout in our relationship with God. Even though the enemy may be attacking us on all sides, just as they were with the children of Israel, so we need to be ready to continue to worship God and not let the things of this life get us down. And yet, even in the midst of those trials, whether it's the enemy coming against us, people come against us too. And sometimes they're within our household even. And it's challenging. It was challenging. Sometimes when we're going through those situations, we want to blame God for those situations that we're facing, don't we? Put yourself in Hannah's shoes for a moment. It says that she was barren. She couldn't have children. Could you imagine what she's going through? You see, during this time period, there could be nothing greater than to have a child, but let alone having a son, because they wanted to carry on the name. They wanted a son to be able to inherit the land in that. And she couldn't give that to her husband. But yet she was a devout Christian. Well, devout in her worship of God. This is before Christ came, but they still had a relationship with Jehovah, Jehovah God. She never gave up on that. She continued to seek him and to ask for a child. But it would have been easy for her to turn and say, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing me to go through this? And we do that many times in our own lives. When we go through tough situations, we say, God, what's going on here? God, why are you doing this to me? Sometimes we want to blame others. And she could easily have thrown everything at Paniah. Gone to her husband and complained. And yet what did she do? Each year they would continue to go up to Shiloh and to pray and to worship and celebrate, to celebrate Passover, celebrate the Day of Atonement, and worship. I want us to realize here for a moment that sometimes things that go on in our lives, God's hand is in the midst of it. Rather than blaming other people and other things in our lives, and rather than complaining to God, saying, God, why are you doing this to me? To begin to look at it with a different set of eyes and begin to look to God as our Father, that there's a reason that this is going on. There's a reason why we don't have children. And sometimes as Mother Day comes around, I've had many people say that they're they're not going to be in church on Mother's Day because they can't have children and they don't want to be reminded of that. And, and that's not something that we really should do. We should not be forsaking the fellowshipping with one another because many of us are not just biological mothers, but we are also spiritual mothers. And we're going to find out in a few moments as we continue reading the story of Hannah, how Hannah, she sought God and she will have a child eventually in God's timing. But she also will be giving that child over to the care of God for the future. 
And that's what we do when we raise our children, when we raise the children within the church. We give them over to the care and the hands of God. And there are things that we can do to bless them, to encourage them, as we see in God's word this morning. But I want us to get a picture for a moment that that this was a devout family, a family that was devoted to God. They were also a heartbroken family. Hannah was heartbroken. It says that she wept and would not eat. In other words, she was fasting. She was praying to God. Year after year after year. And she didn't give up. She didn't throw in the towel and say, that's enough. She didn't give up on her family. She continued to serve God. Notice that her husband showed favor to her by giving her a double portion, trying to bless her, not just because he loved her, but because he didn't want to see her continue in this this torment. You could sense the trouble that would be going on in the family. You could see how the wives would be easily going back and forth at each other at times. It says that, that uh, Paniah would provoke her. It says, grievously to irritate her. It wasn't just a little rub it in your face type of thing. She was pouring salt right into the open wound and making it fester and sting. And Hannah wept and would not eat. But her husband comes up and says, why do you weep? Why are you crying? Why do you not want to eat? Why is your heart sand? He knew what was going on, but he said this, am I not more than 10 sons to you? Sometimes we want something that's beyond our capability to have, and we put so much focus on that, that that becomes our weight. That becomes a a burden for us that's not necessary for us to carry. We get lost. Her husband comes alongside of her and encourages her. And notice what it says in verse 9. It says, after they had eaten and drank in Shiloh, Hannah rose. After he talked her into having some food, after he talked her into um, having something to eat and drink, that she rose up. She rose up from her troubles. She rose up from her challenges and was encouraged. It continues on saying, Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside this doorpost of the temple of the Lord, and she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. When she would go up to the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where they would go up and worship, She would go up there and pour out her heart before God. In other words, she would go up and pray. She would go up and talk with God. It says that she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed, verse 11, a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but you will give us a servant, a son, Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. There's something I want to point out here. 
I want you to notice the term Lord of hosts. This is the first time that this term is used to describe God in the word of God. The Lord of hosts means that he is the Lord of all the angels in heaven. He is the Lord of entire universe. Both in space, here on earth, and everywhere. He is Lord. He is the ruler of all. He is the supreme being. The one that could speak things into existence. He's a sovereign ruler. His ultimate leadership of Israel's armies, his supreme control over all the armies and the hosts of the universe, both heaven and earth, is God's. It's a term for royalty. A name that refers to God as that supreme ruler over all beings and powers of the universe. Remember, the Israelites were surrounded by their enemies. And they were weak. They were not a mighty nation. And yet she's calling out to the almighty God, to the Lord of hosts, the all-powerful, the all-supreme. The Lord of hosts is also a military term. It's used over 260 times in the Old Testament, primarily by the prophets. When they pry, prayed and cried out to God, they didn't address him simply as Lord, but they addressed him as a Lord of hosts. The Almighty One. Isaiah used it, that term 62 times to identify God. Jeremiah used it 79 times. Zechariah 53 times. Malachi 24 times. And these were all prophets of God that called out before God during times of great distress, of times when even the people of Israel were turning away from God. They called out to the Lord of hosts. Notice the next thing that she did is when she called out to the Lord of hosts, she was giving us an example of prayer. In her misery, it seemed to peak at one of the festivals when they were going up to worship God, and she made a vow, which we all have learned to understand that this is a Nazarite vow, where there would be no razor would touch the hair on his head. It's a symbolic of someone that's totally dedicated to God. Some of the requirements you can read over in Numbers chapter 6 and other places where they would go without eating certain foods such as grapes because they were symbolic of the fruit of the vine, of wine, of juice. And they weren't to have any of that. They were to be separated. Something was to be different about them. They were to be in the world but not of the world. They were to be separated. And if you made a Nazarite vow, you would be recognizable because you would have longer hair. You wouldn't have short hair. You wouldn't, you wouldn't cut it in any way. And people would be able to know that there was a separation to God. Notice that she has a renewed commitment to God as she prayed. Because she begins to say, remember me and forget not your servant. She's saying, remember me, I'm your servant. Don't forget about me. Give me a son. And if you give me a son, what? She, she, she makes a vow. She makes a commitment saying, if you give me a son, I'm not going to keep him for myself. I'm going to give him back to you. In fact, I will give him to the temple 
to be raised as a priest. He'll serve you all the days of his life. Even before she's given a child, she's praying. I remember when we were wanting children and we we knew when going into our, our marriage that Kim would not be able to have children. The doctor said that she would never be able to carry children. Because of an injury that she had when she was back in 16, she fell off a motorcycle and was injured. And yet God in his ultimate power and authority, he, he had her get pregnant. We were doing everything not to have children so that we wouldn't have to deal with the miscarriages and that. And she had many of those. It was terrifying at times. And yet God saw in the time, in the, the passing of time, to give us a child. And as you go through pregnancy, you go to the doctor a lot. And as we were going to the doctor, they said, well, you're, you, you need to have an abortion because a child is deformed. And he said, no. And we kept praying and seeking God. Kim was put into the hospital so many times with uh, all sorts of medical conditions. And yet in the passing of time, she gave birth to a perfectly formed little girl. Small as anything. Yes, even smaller than you, Juniper. She she was she was in preemie clothes for nearly the first full year of her life. She was so small. She's not much taller today either. But like I always say, God says, "Lo, I am with you always." He didn't say tall. <laughs> he also says the wicked will be cut off. So eventually, we'll all be short. Not saying that we're wicked, I'm just saying. <laughs> but you know, in the passing of time, we wanted to have another child. We, we, we had a, one child, we wanted to have another one. So we did everything to have children. And nothing happened. One year, two years, three years go by. And then Kim becomes pregnant again. This time we're living on the other side of the mountains. We were, we were living in Seattle at first. Now we're over in Spokane. And we're over there and we go to the doctor and the doctor over there, a different doctor. And she comes up and says, you know what? You might want to consider having an abortion because this child's deformed. We've already been through that once. We said, well, we're going to trust our God. And in the passing of time, Kim still was in and out of the hospital. I don't know how many times because of that pregnancy as well. And in the passing of time, our other daughter was born. She was much larger. In fact, when, when she was born, we put her in Brianna's arms, and she was nearly as big as Brianna was. But she was perfect in every way, except 
she was born without a soft spot on her brain, on her head and they wanted to do surgery and cut her her skull open so it would grow so we made it a matter of prayer we sought after god and god healed her when they were getting ready to do the surgery when she got to be 6 months old we took her into the doctor and the doctor took x-rays and took her back in and did more x-rays and they said we don't understand it because the soft spot that wasn't there is now there and the plates on her on her head even though it's was just the tiny size of a, a your your pinky figure the diameter of your pinky it the the plates in the skull were able to move again an answer to prayer and that's what Hannah did she prayed she sought after God she didn't give up on God even in the midst of her trial even though she was being persecuted if you will by her co-wife or her family if you will even though she was being grievously irritated by Paniah she cried out before God and said God if you'll give me a son, I'm making this vow. I'm making this commitment to you. And that's what we as members of the family of God need to do. We need to pray in our given situations, not giving up on our belief that God can intervene. For we serve a mighty God. We serve the Lord of hosts. We serve the supreme ruler. And nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God. All things are possible with God. We can't give up on that. We need to pour out and seek his face. And my question to us today, to our mothers, uh, to our spiritual mothers, is I challenge you, don't give up on your families. Keep praying, keep seeking. For in due season, it says in the word of God, we will reap a harvest. In due season, we will see changes. In the passing of time, things will change. Notice our testimony in verse 12 it says as she continued praying before lord eli observed her mouth hannah was speaking in her heart only her lips moved and her voice was not heard therefore eli took her to be a drunken woman he misinterpreted what was actually going on she was crying out in anguish but she was doing it in silence although she was praying she was she was moving her lips saying the words but no voice was coming out and Eli who was a priest he he took it as her being drunk and just kind of babbling over there in prayer and Eli addressed her in verse 14 said how long will you be dr go on being drunk put your wine away from you but Hannah answered no no my lord I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. And I know many of us in this room have been praying and pouring our hearts out to God for our families, for families in the church, for those that have young children, for those that don't have any children. For those that are going through struggles, for those that are depressed and going through trials of life. And I want you to know that God hears those prayers. He doesn't give up. He hears us. 
She was pouring out her soul before the Lord. Verse 16, do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all long, I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. In all her great anxiety and vexation, I love those words. In, in her great turmoil, in her great overwhelming situation, she was pouring out her heart to God. And Eli answered, verse 17, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Even though she had been fasting and praying and seeking God. Once she was encouraged by Eli, the priest. Once she was encouraged and said, may God hear your prayer and grant it. After she was encouraged, she got up and then ate and drank. And what was different? It says her face was no longer sad. And we looked last week at our change, our, count, our count, countenance should change when we looked at the transfiguration of Christ. His countenance was changed. He was encouraged because Moses and Elijah appeared to him and encouraged him when he was facing the overwhelming pressure in his life of going up to the cross and dying and taking our place for our sin. Realizing that he would be separated for a short while from the Father. Knowing that he didn't want to take that cup and he asked that, let that cup pass from him. He was still overwhelmed, but yet he was encouraged by the prophets of old. And so we are encouraged when we come to church, when we come with other believers and don't forsake the fellowshipping of one another, we are encouraged, we are given strength, we are given hope in the midst of our turmoil. And Hannah was given hope by the priest. And she was no longer sad. Verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. The Lord remembered her. Notice the next verse. And in due time, in due time, other translations say, in the passing of time or in the completion of time. Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel. For she said, I have asked him from the Lord. Samuel, by the way, means in Hebrew, God hears. God hears. She named him Samuel. God hears. She named him God hears. God hears our prayers. He hears our cries of desperation. He knows when we're in despair. He knows when we're in agony. He knows when we're facing overwhelming situations in our life. And he is hearing us. And he's sending the answer on the way. So don't give up. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. And that's what Hannah was doing. She was asking. She was seeking. She was knocking on the door before God. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41 says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes, we're overwhelmed. Yes, we want to give in. But we don't need to give in to those things that so easily entangle us. We need to watch and pray and seek God. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 7 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, 
but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That's why we have the prayer, the power in prayer when we're, when we're praying in this heavenly language in tongues and we're seeking God and we're praying in the Spirit. Our Spirit is, is speaking with God's Spirit within us. He knows what the words need to be. When we don't know what to pray. Have you ever been there? You don't know what to pray? You're just so overwhelmed. Yeah, we all have. Doesn't mean we give up. It just means we need to continue to pray and to pray in the Spirit. James chapter 5, verse 13 says, If anyone's afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing pra praises or sing psalms. Psalm 105, verse 4 Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face evermore. That means, in other words, don't give up, just keep seeking more and more and more, seeking more of God. And as we pray, God encourages us, God hears us, and he answers. It says in verse 21 that the man of Kana and his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I'll bring him up, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. In other words, she's saying, Hey, I'm keeping my commitment to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend what time I have with him until he's weaned. And at that point, we will take him up to the the temple and he will be dedicated to God and we'll turn him over as we promised to the priest to be raised and kept in their care. I'll bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there what? Forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. I'll think about that for a moment. The husband had every right to overturn the vow of his wife. According to the word of God, he, if, she, if his wife were to make a vow... He could cancel that vow. He had the authority over the household. And yet he says, um, do whatever you need to do, in other words. Only may the Lord establish his word. He's agreeing with her, saying, okay, you're saying you're give it, giving him to a vow. Okay, then we're going to see the fulfillment of this vow through together. even though that means giving up our son. Even though that means turning him over to the priest to be raised. Wait until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, the priest. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. He's remind, she's reminding the priest, Hey, I'm the one that you thought was drunk and that was babbling over here. Remember that? It was just a few years ago. You accused me of being drunk. Well, I'm that woman, and I'm here with this child that you, that God has blessed me with. And as I promised, and I told you in that promise, that I was give him to God if he would give me a son, and here I am presenting him to you.
Verse 27, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I had made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he has lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. They worshiped the Lord there. If you follow on in chapter 2, we don't have time to go through chapter 2 this morning. But there, Hannah begins to pray and give praise to God. And then we find out that she will go up to the temple year after year, as was their custom, because they were devout believers in God, right? Each time that she would go up, she would make Samuel a little robe. Makes me wonder, did Samuel know that that was her mo his mother? Doesn't say there, does it? I believe he probably did. But he wanted to, she wanted to bless him in a special way. Even though he was in the care of the priest, she still wanted to bless him. And that's what we can do as a family here at Christian Worship Center for our families that are going through tough times, that are raising kids. We can be praying for them, but we can also be blessing them. We're going through the store. We see that they may need an extra outfit or some school books or, or whatever, and we can bless them by helping them out. It's not condemning them, saying, well, you can't afford this. No, it's saying, hey, we're coming alongside, and we're linking arms with you, and we're praying for with you, and we're here to help in any way that we possibly can. So we're here praying and joining our hearts together. When we dedicate children up here, it's not just a time where the parents are dedicating their children to God. But it's also a time where we as a congregation agree to support the family in prayer. We agree to join them in seeking God. And, and we also take on responsibility for raising the children. It's not what we're chasing him down saying, don't run in church, little Johnny. But it's coming up and praying for them and blessing them, taking up our, well, our role as spiritual mothers, as spiritual fathers, as spiritual brothers and sisters to encourage them. God hears us. God answers us. Hannah was devout. She was heartbroken and distressed, but that didn't allow her. She didn't allow those circumstances of life to give up. She sought who? The Lord of hosts, the almighty God, the almighty God who was more powerful than anything else. He was in charge of all the armies of heaven, all the armies on the world. He's in charge of everything. And he's the supreme ruler that can speak to our circumstances, can speak to our situation, can speak to that problem that we're facing, and it will be gone and taken care of. He's there to encourage us. He's there to lift us up and to change us into his image. He's there to hear our prayer as we offer it up to him. And he not only hears, but he answers our prayer. And that's our encouragement today. Our encouragement for mothers, don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your families. As a spiritual mother, don't give up on the families in the church, even though we may forget at times to pray for our families. Don't give up on them because they need your prayers. They need your help. And the same thing would go for us men in the church to set an example before the children. For the children will only follow after our examples as men, as women, given over to God. And if we want them to serve God, then we need to serve God.
We have no one else other than God to give us that hope and that peace. If you continue reading, Eli didn't, even though he was a man of God, he didn't set the right example for his children. He didn't correct them in those times that they should have been corrected. You'll discover that through the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3. He still lived an example in front of them, but he didn't correct them. And because of that, he paid a price, a price of losing his two sons all on the same day. We need to set the examples, my friends. We need to pray for our families. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a tough time in your family. I want you to know that God hears and he God sees and that God will answer. Don't give up. We as a family need, will join you in prayer as we seek the Lord together. Mothers, thank you for praying for us in the church. I don't know what it is about mothers, but mothers just seem to know what's going on in, in our lives. It seems like God speaks to our, our mothers And I thank you for praying for us. I've had many spiritual mothers praying for me and my family over the years. And many people say, Ma, you've raised your daughters well. I had one man come up to me who was um, the owner of, of Talia's business, actually. Um, there was a, a Christmas party, and he came. He, he didn't want to attend the Christmas party. He's just one of the partners. But he made a special point to come to the party in his raincoat and rubber boots that were all muddy. He came to the party just to meet me. Because he said, I wanted to meet the man who raised this daughter because you did such a well good job and, and it wasn't me it was us it wasn't Kim and I that raised the children it's the family of God that raised the children so the credit goes to the glory of God Amen? So together, let's join and link arms. Join and link our prayers together as we seek God together to change our families, to change us, to change our community. Amen? Amen. Father, right now, I ask you to move amongst our hearts. Maybe we're here today with, with a heavy heart. Maybe we're here with situations going on in our lives that we just want to acknowledge to you, God, that we have a need in our life, and we're asking you to meet that need. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand before God, just saying, God, I have a situation that I want to give to you. Yes, yes, thank you, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. You're giving that need to God. Yes, thank you. And put your hands down. Father, you've seen these hands that have been raised. You've seen the ones that haven't been raised. They're going through situations as well. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would do whatever is necessary to tear down every wall, every barrier that's hindering your work to take place in that situation. Give them the same hope as you gave to Hannah, Father. Even though she had gone years without a child, you still gave her hope. Give them the same hope, the same peace, that you are the Lord of hosts, the almighty God. 
and encourage them. Hear their prayer and answer. For we are joining our hearts together with them. And we're asking, we're seeking, and we're knocking. We're fasting. We're praying. As a family of God. A family given to you. A family that's your children. Bless them, Father. May you bless them and keep them. May you shine your face towards us, upon us. Be gracious to us. May you turn your face towards us and give us peace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in the blessings and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in his strength. Go in his peace. Go in his power. And change this world for Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Mother's Day. As you're going out, please pick up a couple of the silk roses. And uh, there's some potted plants out there as well. Pick up one of those as you're leaving. And may God bless you, ladies. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.